who I mentioned this song a couple of times already in the past few weeks, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. A line from a song that many of us boomers learned in Sunday school if we grew up going to Sunday school. It's a simple song with a simple message. And children growing up in a home with loving parents who demonstrated kindness and care might really have gotten the message. They might have come to believe that there is a God who came in human form and loved the people so much that he welcomed those who were shunned and he healed diseases so that people could live their lives of ice without isolation and fear. Perhaps some of these same children, though, did not come to believe. And what about those children whose homes did not feel like home and were not particularly safe places to be? What about those children who went to bed hungry at night or slept in a shelter with mom if there happened to be space in the shelter or in a car because their parents could not afford first and last month's rent plus a cleaning deposit plus a filing fee plus a utility deposit for all the for the next apartment because they were evicted from the previous apartment from the last apartment when they could not pay the rent or would children in such circumstances ever find themselves in a place where someone sang about or proclaimed the love of Jesus? Yet, I know and I believe that God is able to work through any number of people to be the bearers of Christ's love and light in the world, even in the lives of children who experience some of life's most dire circumstances. The message is one we hope our lives will proclaim. We hope that the decisions that we make and the activities that we are involved in, not just as individuals, but also as a community of faith, profess and proclaim loudly what we say we believe. And this will be the good news to the world. Jesus calls us as individuals and communities of believers to be his body in the world, continuing in the way of that he taught. Now, how are we doing with that these days with so many ongoing adjustments to what we thought we had figured out about being church? Now let me assure you that though we as a congregation are not able to serve in the same ways, there are still things that we can do, that we are doing. We are not called to be famous for our actions, nor are we to engage in spectacular demonstrations that draw attention to ourselves so that we can post it on Instagram flashed across social media, look at us. No, we can do what we are called to do and share it modestly, thankfully, joyfully. We move the mountains of despair and we help shoulder the burdens of others with each act of prayer and kindness. For example, the mission committee, in assessing how the GPC would continue to serve others, has found a way to meet a very local need. Now, because the drinking water, the fountains at Berg Elementary School have been turned off because of the pandemic, the mission committee decided to supply bottled water. They stepped in to provide cases of bottled water, relieving teachers from the expense of having to buy it out of their own pockets. 
We thank those who ask the question, how can we help our neighbors? How can we be light and a witness to what we know to be true about our saving God? In Christ, we find one who reaches out to us and says, Come all who are weary and weighed down with heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Is that not the Savior in whom we rest, in whom we live and move and have our being? Now, sometimes that rest will come in the form of peace and strength to make a, dif a difficult decision. Or it may come in the form of compassion and support shown to us by someone else. Now, today, in both the epistle and the gospel reading, we hear about the impact that believing in Jesus makes in human lives. God saves us in Christ Jesus, fulfills our needs, moves us into the path of new life, and enables us to go out as Jesus did to love and serve God's world. We learn from Jesus what it is to live in community, but not just to live in community, stick on the periphery, kind of be on the margins and watch from afar, but to be in community with one another. Maybe not with everybody, that's hard, but maybe there are places within the body of faith where we gravitate because of our interest, our passion, our skill, our gifts. Not everyone is a singer. Not everyone works with their hands. Not everyone is technologically savvy. Not everyone is good with children. But we bring all these gifts together and see what God can do. We learn from Jesus what it is to live in community with others. We are at times the ones who are in need, and at other times we are the ones providing the support and the encouragement as we are empowered by God to do so, and I hope that it's something we have practiced, and as we live longer in life, something that becomes more and more part of who we are, this give and take, being able to ask for help, being able to ask for prayer, being able to give prayer, or to give support and encouragement, back and forth, being with one another in life. This is our witness to the world doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be best buds, but it does mean we need to have an open spirit, and, and Christ will give us that. The church is not the place we go or become a part of because it's all about me, 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 and just me. It is about me, but it doesn't end there. If it does, I hope the Spirit will convict you to see that you are saved for a purpose, and it goes beyond just you. The church is, is not this place where it's just about me. It is where we find the truth that God has created us all for fullness of life and saves us to bring such good news into the world because some don't know this. Some have not encountered this. Some have not been exposed to this. And God will use our lives to bear witness to this truth that God sent the Son into the world that all might be saved. This month marks the one year anniversary of the impact of this novel virus, COVID-19. Now, in a matter of weeks, a week's time last year, the session of this church met to take decisive action to keep people safe and to assist in slowing down the spread of the COVID-19 uh, virus, put an end to in-person worship. The buildings were closed. Worship went strictly online, except for, what were there, four or five of us in the building, <laughs> if that. For those able to watch worship, 
services on computers, tablets, or smartphone, phone, smartphones. This was not the most uh, desirable arrangement, but it was the safest. Now, worship and ministry have not stopped. We know this. You have only to look at the announcements in the back of the bullet and the C that ministry has not stopped, or read the monthly crossroads to see ministry has not stopped. But it's taken on a different configuration in a variety of ways. And getting accustomed to these changes is taking time. Working out the kinks is slow and ongoing because we are, after all, working with volunteers, those moved to participate and to help and to assist. There are a few of us who get paid to help guide the efforts, encourage the efforts, be here to address questions, and there were times to receive the frustration and the anger and upset, but to hold it, that the whole body might continue to take the next steps forward. Now, what do you remember about the last year? Some of our recollections will overlap, and others will be different depending on our sphere of, of friends and activities. Friends, no matter our differences, we are all human beings in need of care and comfort and guidance. We need this all from our Savior, our teacher, our guide. God is showing the world a different way of being because of the difference that Jesus Christ has made in our lives. Were we by nature children of wrath, as Paul describes us in Ephesians, Ephesians reading? And if so, are we now alive in Christ by God's doing? In our, our, is our life showing that? Do we and will we live the truth that can make a difference in our lives and will we support others in their growth in Christ? This is not to say that we will be perfect. This is not to say we will not at times be short on patience or be snippy at each other. We are still human. But because of the changes that Christ has made in our spirits, we will be more sensitive and attuned to those times when we cross that line. Our conscience will prick us, and the grace and the spirit of the Holy Spirit will enable us to turn around and say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to snap at you like that. Or I'm sorry for whatever the incident may have been. We will be equipped to acknowledge that in order to mend relationships and to strengthen them. We also will be able to hear when someone comes to us to express what, they, what is on their hearts. Again, it doesn't mean that we're going to be able to accommodate everybody or to appease everybody, but the Spirit of Christ is going to enable us to find more healthful and helpful ways of interaction, human being to human being. And as we grow in faith, we grow in community, this again is our gift to the world. Now, I've been reading recently a book called Trauma and Grace, written by a woman who um, President and Roosevelt Professor of Systematic Theology at Union Theological Seminary. And I started out reading this oh, a year and a half ago because of my interest in what the church can bring to those who have experienced trauma. Uh, a lot of my work in previous ministries beyond the, the congregation had to do with working with people who had traumatic, experienced traumatic experiences. So I picked this book up. And I found it very helpful in terms of understanding uh, ways to talk about the death of Jesus. I mean, you have a healthy psyche, a healthy, healthy psychology, you are whole and don't feel threatened, don't experience trauma. You may be able to hear about this violent act against
is Jesus. For some, it's really hard to hear that. And so helping folks who might be triggered by such a violent event to help them understand what that means. What was God doing on allowing this to happen? Helping folks grapple with the grace of God and the love of God so that they are not, uh, so that that is not a stumbling block to them understanding a life-giving God, a God of resurrection, a God of hope, a God of protection. So I commit, <clears throat> I don't know how many of those of you like reading theology or <laughs> exploring theology, but I found it very helpful. Trauma and grace. We read these scriptures and we sometimes depend on others to, to explain it to us. And others can be helpful. A preacher can be helpful. But by no means is the preacher the final word. God is the final word, and the Holy Spirit is the one who takes the information you are exposed to, the faith of your spirit and being, and brings you into a fuller and deeper understanding and relationship with him. So yes, it's a very simple message. Jesus loves me, this I know. The Bible tells me so. Well, then what? May we continue to grow in faith so that we, are, we do not remain children of God, but become mature adults, adult, adult men, adult women, adult adults maturing in faith. May it be so. To the God who was, who is, and will be, now and forever. Amen.